Oh, ladies and gentlemen, make a crazy amount of noise. The great Lisa Welch is right here. Make some noise for Lisa. I said it back there, I'll say it again. That show is so much fun. Oh my God. Oh, it is fun. It really is. Uh, congratulations. Thank you so much for being here and hanging out with us. Uh, you got an awesome new show. Uh, you're celebrating 40 years, The Facts of Life, 40 year anniversary, which is wild. I'll hold for applause. 40 years, guys, for The Facts of Life. A lot of fun stuff to talk about today. Before we get into any of it, I always love beginning. Just how are you doing? How's this whole process going for you right now? You're all over the place talking about everything, right? I know. Yeah, yeah it's a very busy season. It's going really, really well. I'm enjoying this. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't pursuing anything. This, this show came to me, and I thought, man, that just sounds like too much fun to pass up, and I'm so glad I didn't. Well, that's really, that's exciting. That actually dovetails nicely into one of the, the first questions I wanted to ask was how you got involved, because this is one of those shows that, like, for a lot of people, is almost like a dream gig. You get to travel, you get to see all these, you get to meet all these really interesting people, you get to see all these cool, like, toys and collectibles and it stuff. It is a dream gig, So, yeah, right. so where did it come from? How did it, how did it find its I place? have a friend that uh, produced um, a, a, a pilot for my daughter and I that did not make it, mm -hmm. but I I guess I made an impression on him. So when it came, when he had this idea, he came asking if I was interested, and it's just right in my wheelhouse. I'm so curious about everything. I love learning. I love education. And the crazy thing is, I learned so much through these collectibles uh, about things I ne I didn't know anything about about history and certainly about people. These collectors are. That's just my favorite part of the whole job. Well, it's one of the fun things that you get to do is you get to, one, you're meeting these fascinating people and, and you're connecting. They're so intensely passionate about this thing that they've collected over the years. And then you have an expert comes and you get to be there and share how much it's approximately worth and, and what the like the monetary value is for this thing that they've they love so much. And in the episodes I've seen, they were elated. They were overjoyed. That's got to be a fun moment to be a part of, to get to do that, to bring that joy to somebody. It is a fun moment. And yet there's still a little drama because they find out how much things are worth worth but then the real twist is we know we found out uh, through our sources an, an elusive item that's been on their wish list and we try to figure out a way to get that and then we bring it in to offer them a trade the problem is they have to trade it for something of equal value and it isn't a, even about the monetary value usually if it's something of equal value it's what it took for them to get that to track it down to finally find it to be able to win it if it was like in a, in a auction of some sort and then they have to decide do they really want this thing they've been hunting for enough to give up something that's Every single piece, I don't care if like Winnie the Pooh, where she has a whole another separate house full of Winnie the Pooh items, I, I think she'd have a hard time giving up even one of them. She has a whole separate house? I saw yes. The Wizard of Oz where there was a secret door oh, uh, yeah, that led right. to like a, a hallway mm -hmm. that curved around, but uh, the Winnie the Pooh has an entire other house. Yes, so she has a two-bedroom home, and she and her husband live there. No children, but lots of little Pooh children, apparently, um, not as opposed to children who poo, just a whole nother, two different, that's two a different, different thing kind. entirely. Uh, and outgrew the house, bought the house next door, and filled it up with Winnie the Pooh. I love when they outgrew that. When you mean with their collection, they outgrew the house. That's right. And it came time to make a decision. Yes, right. The call they made <laughs> was buy the house next door. Get another house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, I had no idea Winnie the Pooh collecting was so lucrative. Yeah, they, commitment to their passion for sure. Would that? Would you classify that as the most, if not one of the more surprising moments or, or things that oh, you learned? Oh, golly, on this? there's so many surprising moments. No, I, maybe in the top ten, uh, yeah. but. No, I, what would be surprising? There's what so many. <laughs> oh, well, I do. The secret room in The Wizard of Oz yeah, totally I shocked me. Say, yeah. I was not ready for that. Um, and not only did they have a secret room in the house, but it was filled with more Winnie the, w w Wizard of Oz things. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, let's see. It's, I would have to say the collector who collects um, locks of presidential hair. What? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't I, know if you heard at home, there was an audience member who exclaimed, what? Uh, and oh. you are correct <laughs> because we're going to go into that. Uh, locks of presidential hair? Right. Like how? he has a George Washington and Abraham. No. Le yes. <laughs> like how do you even know? And he yeah. has a provenance for it to authenticate it. Jo uh, John Kennedy, Abraham Lincoln. So apparently back in the day, if you were going to invite somebody to some kind of soiree, you would also uh, authenticate that this was really George Washington asking you over to his house because he would send a lock of his hair. 
and everybody immediately could identify his hair back in that day. <laughs> that was a very, it was a full, it was a foolproof system. But because is, they're wearing wigs, so I don't know. Oh, yeah, exactly. Remember? No two locks of hair were the same. They're like fingerprints back then. It's not like they then. had DNA testing back then. Yeah, no, I, I feel like the person with this collection may have been lied to about something at some point. Well, you would think so, except they, that is something they are very, very passionate about, is getting the provenance for it. No, this is real. This yeah. has really happened. And so none of this fake stuff. At the risk of spoiling the lock of hair episode, did they ask or did they answer at all how the heck that got started? Like, wh how did they... Where does that begin? I, I don't know. I mean, really, I we'll guess it's... watch and find I, out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Okay, so that, that brings up another question that I had was, how much um, research do, do they ask of you, or do they give you any like information going in before you see the collections, before you meet the people? Do you prefer to go in blind and experience it, or do they tell you a couple of things? I prefer to go in blind. Now, they've done all their research, so they know which, which items are going to be the most fun to highlight, but I like just to inter interview them cold. That's just something I enjoy doing either anyway. I'm a life coach now, and the reason I got into it is just because I'm fascinated with people, and, I've, yeah. and it's all about questions. I mean, people pay me just to ask them questions, so like... <laughs> <laughs> kind of like you. Yeah, no, it's I've tricked a, a whole corporation into <laughs> cutting me a check every once in a while to sit here and do this. I don't know how so they have not caught on what yet. What should I do with my life? Well, I I, honestly, don't get, hold on to this for dear life because <laughs> yeah. this is a pretty easy gig. It is, though. I love my job. I really do. I love it. But this uh, opportunity to travel around and to meet these people and hear their stories, and they're always so heartwarming. The, uh, you can trace the collections usually back to something that they experience that they're just hanging on to, usually in childhood, usually related to another person that means a lot to them, right. uh, oftentimes keeping the memory alive. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really it's, uh, inspirational. I can't stop thinking about it. Maybe that person's mom worked at a presidential hair salon, and maybe, like, there's a memory there. Like, I just got to know what that story right. is. <laughs> it's going to drive me crazy. Um, were you a fan... Uh, are you a fan of the of sort of the genre? Do you ever watch shows like like uh, like the Antique Roadshow or whatever before? Because there's that element of like uh, that that makes these shows so addicting of seeing these things. Like I could have something like that, or I remember having something like that, and then finding out it's worth a couple of hundred thousand dollars. That is definitely yeah. a big uh, draw of this show. Yeah. There's so many things that I just enjoyed because thinking, uh, seeing them. Oh my goodness, uh, I had that little, I had yeah. that doll as a child, or I saw that telephone on. Uh, Dick Van Dyke show and when I would watch it as a kid yeah. and that is part of the um, I think part of the real draw of the show is that we do see ourselves and it brings back memories and um, and then we learn things that we didn't know there's lots of collections that I didn't know anything about them and actually end up getting very fascinated and, and un really you get to understand the beginning you think why would anybody collect that and then by the end you're going oh yeah that's cool maybe I can find me something like that on a garage sale have you, um, are, are you at all at heart a collector? Did you ever collect anything you know, my, at home? My aunt was an antique dealer, and so she traveled with me in my 20s, and we would go all over the world, and I would work, and she would go look for things to bring back to her antique shop, and so she taught me an awful lot about collecting. It's amazing. I remember when I was a kid, I don't think I was ever like an officially collector, but when you're younger and you're little, you like you collect your action figures and you collect like uh, McDonald's had these commemorative right. glasses for like every movie that came out when I insisted we get all of them. You know what I'm talking about. So like there's all those fun things. Uh, what about when your kids were little? Did they have little fun things that they collected and they oh held on gosh, to? Oh my gosh, yes. And uh, they really, they, Beanie Babies was a big thing. And so, yes. And so I wish I had, I had the picture. I have a picture of them. I took them to the mall and took the, set them in Front in the middle of all of their Beanie Babies surrounded by them. And so they, they probably would not like it if I actually very explained cool. that picture. Very, very cool. Um, you, so you, you know, speaking of family and speaking of children, you, um, you kind of took a break from show business for a little bit uh, and you were, you know, working on your books and, and you did a little bit of music, you did all sorts of stuff. Uh, and then around, was it, I want to say 2012, you did Survivor, you came right. back to TV. Mm -hmm. And then more recently we got the, the Hallmark movies you right. did, which were great. Um, when you finally came back to a, a film set, when you were going back to work on those Hallmark movies and stuff like that, you know, was that, uh, was that scary? Were you excited? What was going through your head as you were getting back into that side of things? Yeah, it was scary. I was really surprised that because I've been acting since I was a child. But I, yeah. I, I did take uh, about 20 years off because I, I left show business to raise my kids. And then after they were off in college, that's when I moved back to L.A. and started working again. And I'll have to say I was kind of... 
I felt out of place. Like maybe like a baseball player that the, the swing's just not quite right, you know, and that's what it felt like. I, um, I went through a little bit of insecurity and thinking, man, think times have changed. Acting has changed. Sitcoms, you could be really big, and now everything's really subtle, and you just, this is me acting, and I'm going to win something yeah. big for this award. You were very serious. Exactly. Yeah. And so it, the making the transition was a little bit difficult. Thankfully, I went. Uh, one of the first things I did was uh, a Medea's Christmas. That's right. So <laughs> that's just one big sitcom. <laughs> that's yeah, that's a fun way to ease back into things. Yes. Also, though, uh, Tyler Perry and those those productions, notoriously very like very big productions. Like he, he puts a lot into those. Are very pa like very passionate about those projects. It's a big movie set for you to just walk back on. Also, how did that happen? How did you, you know why that happened? <laughs> Good question. Now that you ask, uh, 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 Tyler Perry's a big Survivor fan. Get out. Yeah. So he saw you. So on Saw me on Survivor, <laughs> and uh, then he's also a friend with Jeff of Jeff Probst, mm -hmm. and so I um, I hadn't done any acting until I went back to, until Survivor was not acting, and I didn't do it because it was on television. I did it because I'm a huge fan of the show. Yeah. Uh, but then I moved back to LA, and so Medea was the first uh, the first big thing I did. That's pretty amazing that you would do this thing that you were a big fan of. You go on Survivor, and it sort of uh, kind of thrusts you back into the scene. Did you? I mean, did you anticipate that at all? Or when you went into Survivor, were you just like, I'm going because I'm a fan of this thing, and I want this life experience? Right, yeah. I uh, had been wanting to be on Survivor forever, but you have to you have to give like two months of your life because even though I was on there 39 days, seven weeks away, and um, they cast you and you're on a plane within a couple of weeks. So I travel around and speak and ha didn't have two months off that far in advance. Yeah, I was booked far in advance and so I never could. But I was booked for a year long speaking tour. The president was let go they hired somebody else and then like nixed all the speakers so I had an entire year open which at first crushed me and then it was like okay I've been taught by a friend what does this make possible and I thought oh my gosh I can be a survivor <laughs> so I filmed a little audition tape and put it on social media and tagged Jeff Probst in CBS and somebody got a got a, a sneak peek of it yeah. and called me and I auditioned it's pretty wild. And you do have to audition, and it's a pretty grueling process. What, uh, what do you remember? What's the most intense part of the audition that you remember? Well, you are in a hotel for a few days, and you can't talk to anybody. You can't talk to anybody at home. You can't talk to anybody. I mean, it's so it's kind of, a, if you make it through the process, I guess they figure maybe she can handle it on the uh, island. They strand you in a hotel first. That's yeah, how they, they do it. They, and they, they go, do. okay. But it's it, a lot of people, I'm introverted, so I'm okay with it. I did a 30-day silent retreat once, so I was cool <laughs> with that part. But it, it is a little bit nerve-wracking for some people mm. to just kind of be isolated like that. Yeah, and imagine. you have to go through a bunch of psychological tests and wow. all that. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so you do that show, and then all of a sudden, uh, you're in uh, Medea's Christmas, Tyler Perry wants you to do that, and then Hallmark gives you a call and says, we've got these great movies we want you to do. Yeah. And that's how kind of everything just sort of came together and snowballed. Yeah, and I yeah. actually got to do one of the Hallmark movies was with Kim Fields, who yeah. played Tootie, and the other was with my daughter, and she played my daughter. And yeah. so that was really so a great fun. memory. You know, talking about uh, uh, Kim and, and Keep in Touch, notoriously, I, I was reading a bunch of articles, the, all of you, you know, celebrating 40 years here of the Facts of Life, all of you said the, that you've kept touch over the years. Right. And I'm curious, how has that friendship evolved or grown as means of communication has changed, as your mm -hmm. lives have changed? Like, what does that look like now? How is it different from, uh, you know, 20 years ago? I think it ago? probably looks like many people, they're friends from college and high school. It's, you know, your lives go in different directions, but when you get back together, it's just like old times and we all live in different parts of America so typically if I happen to be in, going to Texas I'll visit Nancy or Atlanta visit Kim or in, in LA uh, visit Mindy I live in Nashville now so um, but Nancy just joined social media we're all on social media Nancy right. finally joined and so now we're actually like everybody else keeping up with our friends that way do you guys have like a group text message thread? Do you, have you have bridged that gap yet? We I, do have a group thread. Yes, we do. Does the group have a fun little name? Uh, it doesn't, <laughs> but we need, I have, I mean, I, my kids, I have a, you know, a group thread and I, yeah. I put the little emojis and everything, but you're right. I totally need to I it's up my social media, my group text yeah. thread. It gets name. overlooked often. Uh, no. People don't think to give it a fun name, but everyone. Do they in a think while, to give it the fun emoji? So, see, that's also a big part of it. I think you got to let your creative flag fly and just you figure do. it out and just go where the wind <laughs> takes you. Speaking of keeping up with people, uh, you keep up uh, with George. 
George Clooney there, that little guy? Did you ever, did you ever talk to him you, since then? You, you know, he follows me on Facebook. He's always DMing me. But He's I, keeping tabs on you. I, yeah, you don't exactly. need to follow I, him. No, I blocked him. You know what? <laughs> blocked him. Yeah, because he hassles you. He doesn't totally leave you alone. Yeah, you he know, strikes me as the kind of troll, guy to do that. Truly, yeah, you know? He's the reason for all the niggas. No, he's a, he's a wonderful person, I'm sure. Yes. It's just always so interesting when you uh, when you cross paths with people like that early on. Do, you know, was there any sense uh, of, 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 no one could ever predict uh, people like George when you meet them and they're going to go on to be and live the life that he leads. But what was that like? What do you remember from those couple of seasons, those early days and the times that you guys spent together? Well, you nailed it. When none of us would have guessed because he, uh, he was cute, but not like he is now. He was a good actor, but not like he is now. So he really did. He's like a fine wine, I guess. He really has aged quite well. He's notoriously like one of those fun-loving trickster types. Was he yes. like that on set as well? It's yes, April Fool's exactly. Day today. But did Very he ever play? Very fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was he ever? Did he ever do any pranks or anything on set? Do you recall or remember? Uh, no. Not to me. No. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. Nice. Well done. No. Um, you know, I was reading a lot uh, in preparation uh, for our talk because, like I said, it is the the 40 year anniversary. It's a big deal. In fact, the uh, I believe on the day that this premieres, you're hosting a great marathon on MeTV right. as yeah. well. Right. Yeah. MeTV is doing. It's called Lisa's Call. They asked me to choose yeah. five of my favorite shows, and we filmed over 200. So that was very difficult to do. Yes. Uh, and so they're going to air those on Sunday night, and then um, the premiere will be after that. So the most fun for, for me and about that is I have all my kids are grown and they have significant others. So they're coming over and we're going to watch the Facts of Life together. And we haven't done that since wow. they were, you know, like 11 or 12 years old. And uh, my son's 29. So it'll, it'll be fun to do, share that together. Is somebody making a big dinner that night, too? You're going to make a big event out of it? You're going to cook? I am just, you know, I was... No. I was working when I, <laughs> and I've never been a good cook. So no, we will be we will be ordering something in. I'm sure. Yeah, but I'm sure you got a favorite place. You'll make it nice. That's It'll be true. fun. Yes. Um, you know, something I really wanted to ask you about that I thought was fascinating and really uh, cool, and, and, and speaks to just uh, your character was that back in the day, there's a story that uh, they wanted to do a story of Blair losing her virginity, and 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 you were uncomfortable doing that, and you kind of took a stand and said, I don't I don't really want to tell that story. I don't feel right about it. And what blew me away about that was the the strength and your convictions at such a young age to stand up to a television crew and say, this is not for me, I'm not comfortable. Was that scary to, to have to, to say that and, and stick to your guns like that and do that back then? You know what? It was scary, but it was not never it was never an option for me. I just knew it was the second season of Facts of Life. Uh, I was 16, I think, at the time. Uh, I just knew a lot of eight, nine, ten-year-old girls are watching the show, and there's just that's way too weighty a responsibility to deal with a subject like that. Knowing young girls are going, are they're thinking about that kind of thing? And I also understood that you know, no matter how they, uh, however they they wrote it, it would still be something that could be resolved in 17 minutes and a couple of commercials and a group hug, that and that's just not yeah. life, really. Yeah, for sure. Well, still, uh, really, really cool story, I think, that at 16, you were able to identify that thing and, and stand your ground and tell a whole bunch of adults with, with uh, a whole lot of money that this was not something that you were It would were probably be harder doing. for me now, because yeah. I would actually know what I was doing. <laughs> There's an ignorance is bliss element exactly. to it, isn't there? Yes, yeah. there is. You know, uh, speaking of ignorance and bliss and, and, and how it was when you were 16 at the time, you know, uh, that show, I mean, it was massive. Here we are talking about it 40 years later. And I just wonder how you navigated the, those those fan interactions back then, especially when the show was at its peak. You know, you look at network TV now, and if you got a couple of million, it's it's good. But back then, that was like prime time, number one show. And so everybody kind of knew who you were. So I just wonder, at, at an early age, what was it like uh, navigating those waters and dealing with fame like that? And you know, I think it was in a lot of ways easier back then because even though there were only three channels so there was much more recognition because families would all gather together they only had a what few options uh, I don't even know if they had you know remote control back then so if you were on a channel you stayed on a channel um, but we didn't have the internet back then and I think that's one of the things that makes it really harder these days for celebrities and so um, and again the ignorance is bliss uh, element of it I, I mean I just did, didn't know I was on television at 12 on the Mickey Mouse Club and then went to the Facts of Life so it's really my only frame of reference for life was, was dealing with that mm -hmm. did you have little disguises and stuff when you go out did you have like a baseball a cap mustache, little mustache little and glasses the whole night <laughs> 
Actually, I really wanted to ask you about. Uh, Actually, my you know, truth, truthfully, my disguise is going as myself. Really? But yes, because Blair is always about clothes and heels and you know, all, makeup, and I mean, I've got it on now because I'm here on television. But typically, I'm in sweats, my hair's pulled back, no makeup, so it's I'm my best disguise. What a comfortable disguise! <laughs> it is That's very wonderful. comfortable. Uh, we're going to go to the audience in a second, but I also, uh, as someone who uh, went to school for animation and is a big Disney nut, when I saw, uh, realized that, of course, you were uh, a, mu a mouseketeer, I was like, i got to ask you about what, what do you remember from that time? Are you still, uh, many years later, considered a part of the Disney family when you go? Do they let you skip lines? Are you, are you in like, the inside of a special club? What, what's it like being a mouseketeer? You know what it really was? <laughs> it was a dream job for sure because at you know 12 and 13 is when we filmed it. And, you know, I mean, we filmed uh, 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 Fridays were filmed at Disneyland. So if we did a production number, we had to do it before the park was open, yeah. which, I mean, that's just a cool thing. Very cool. Yeah. So, no, I have lots of great memories. Very, very cool. Well, I don't want to detract from any of the time from our audience. We've got uh, a couple of questions out there. Thank you, Kate. Uh, the first one's coming to us from right over here. How you doing? Hello. Lisa. Hi. I'm a big fan. It's an honor to meet you. Thank um, you. Um, you guys were talking about the Facts of Life before, and I know that you guys are all still good friends, mm -hmm. and since the 40th anniversary is coming up, might we see, like, a get-together or a reunion or something with all of you? Maybe. We don't have anything solid right now, but we actually did all get on a conference call last month, and we're, we are at a time now. Our, our kids are uh, getting old enough. Uh, their kids, uh, my kids are grown. Their kids are getting old enough, and we're thinking, you know, it would be great to work together again, so we'll Very see. Cool. Yeah, the time is right. Thank you very much for that question. It's just a big thing right now. Every other show is a, a, a reboot or a revisiting. And, and I don't know that we would do a reboot um, so much because I think we would like to do something other than those characters, but we'd like to work together. So we'll see if we can make something like that So we happen. may, we may, we may see you all work together again. I may be Joe, yeah. and she may be Tootie. <laughs> I mean, we're just going to just mix it. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a lot of fun. All right, we'll keep an eye out for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Kate, do I have another one? I've got one more. Fantastic. Let me do one more question. Come right on over. Hi. Hi. Um, so since Nancy and Kim did Dancing with the Stars, would you ever consider doing it? Uh, so I would never consider never. it. Never. Never. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, people ask me a lot of times if I'd ever do Survivor again. And I tell them I would never do that. The only way I would do that is if in some alternative universe I had to choose between Dancing with the Stars or Survivor. Then I would do Survivor. But uh, that tells you how much I do not want to do Dancing with the Stars. I'm a terrible dancer. Wow. If, we, if you could do any reality competition show, where, where would you mm. feel most comfortable? Where, Boy, where would a, you be primed? That's a good question. I don't know that I would do another reality one yeah. because I really did Survivor because I loved yeah. the show. And But uh, if I had to just f to answer this question, yeah. Yeah, exactly. probably, It'd yes, fun. Amazing Race, I think. Amazing Race. Yeah. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, it would be fun. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like American Ninja Warrior probably wasn't in the running or something. Probably like not. Probably, probably not. Not really what it. you're looking to do right now, but it's out there. Um, guys, thank you so much for your questions. Thanks for being an awesome audience. we we got to wrap things up. Lisa, uh, I'm sure you've got a million other things to go to, so I'm really uh, excited that you took time to come hang out My and pleasure. do this one with thank us. Uh, I'll remind the world watching, uh, if you head and check out uh, MeTV on April 7th at 10 p.m., uh, you're going to see the premiere of uh, Collector's Call. But if you tune in much earlier than that, there's a fantastic fantastic marathon of Facts of Life, the Facts of Life that Lisa herself is hosting. Check out her favorite episodes. Uh, I heard a little bit of applause. It's premature, but I'll take it. Let's make <laughs> some noise for the great Lisa Welchel right here, please. Let's go.